This is the first in a series of lectures about the imaging of the thyroid gland. Let's talk now about the thyroid gland. The normal thyroid gland sits at the base of the neck. It has two lobes, one on either side of the trachea, and a connecting isthmus across the center. There's also a variable pyramidal node lobe extending superiorly from the center of the isthmus. The normal thyroid gland is substantially more dense than the surrounding soft tissue. In fact, on an unenhanced scan, it will be usually the densest of the soft tissues. This is because the thyroid gland is responsible for concentrating iodine, and as we know from iodinated contrast, iodine is very good at attenuating our, the energies of photons that we use in CT. The thyroid gland is also very vascular and shows substantial enhancement on post-contrast imaging. The normal thyroid gland is about 20 grams, and the example shown here is about the normal size. This is what we expect to see for a normal thyroid gland. The uh, region of the thyroid gland is prone to artifacts, and this beam hardening artifact that we're seeing running across the center of the thyroid gland is common. It comes from uh, uh, beam hardening from the shoulders. Sometimes we will try to draw the shoulders down to get them out of the way if we are imaging for thyroid pathology, but often this is impossible in larger individuals. Diseases of the thyroid gland can be divided into developmental anomalies, solitary nodules, thyromegaly, and thyroid carcinoma. In order to understand developmental anomalies in particular, it's useful to review the embryology of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland begins fetal life at the foramen cecum at the base of tongue. From there, during fetal life, it migrates down the front of the neck to its normal, familiar adult position at the base of the neck. As it does so, it leaves a trail behind it, uh, sort of a trail of slime like a snail, except this isn't mucus, this is an epithelial tract called the thyroglossal duct. Normally, the thyroglossal duct will completely involute. However, if a small amount of the epithelial lining remains, or if a small amount of functioning thyroid tissue gets left along the path, then we can develop into thyroglossal duct cysts. Notice this weird relationship of the thyroglossal duct and the hyoid bone. This occurs because the hyoid bone forms after the thyroglossal duct and envelops the thyroglossal duct. So when the hyoid bone rotates up into its adult configuration in, the hor in a horizontal or transverse plane, it wraps that thyroglossal duct remnant along with it, and you can, this is how we get intralaryngeal forms of thyroglossal duct cysts. But if you want to make the diagnosis of thyroglossal duct cyst, make sure that it is along this embryologic path, because that's the only place you can find them. The other really important thing about thyroglossal duct cysts is that once you get below the hyoid bone, the thyroglossal duct cyst runs right in the strap muscles. And that close relationship between the strap muscles and the thyroglossal remnant allows us to make a specific diagnosis. Here's a classic example of a thyroglossal duct cyst below the level of the hyoid bone. It is a smooth walled cystic structure. These can become more complex if they get repeatedly infected, but usually they are thin walled. And it is embedded within this left strap muscle. So midline mass embedded in the strap muscle, purely cystic, a classic appearance for thyroglossal duct cyst. This T2-weighted image shows a less classic, but still very familiar version of a thyroglossal duct cyst. This isn't down in the strap muscles. We are way up at the base of tongue. How do you get a thyroglossal duct cyst way up here? Well, this is where the thyroglossal duct starts. This is the location of the frame and cecum. And so a cystic mass in the posterior tongue is most likely going to be a thyroglossal duct cyst. 
Here's another congenital anomaly of the thyroglossal duct or of thyroid development. Here we see an enhancing mass with imaging characteristics identical to that of the thyroid gland, but in an entirely unexpected location. This is at the base of tongue. Well, this thyroid gland never migrated. It grew here at the base of tongue and never went down the front of the neck. This is called a lingual thyroid. It will cause dysphagia, and the treatment is surgical. You can simply remove this ectopic tissue. However, sometimes the patient does not have any normal thyroid tissue down at the base of the neck, and removing this will render the patient hypothyroid for life. That's not really the end of the world for these patients because they can take thyroid supplementation, but they should be aware of that risk benefit. Usually these patients are screened with ultrasound to see if there's any normal thyroid tissue in the orthotopic location. In addition to thyroglossal duct cysts, you can get remnants of functional thyroid tissue anywhere along the thyroglossal duct. Here is functional thyroid tissue um, that is embedded within the strap muscles, just where you'd expect to see a thyroglossal duct cyst, but this is thyroid tissue. So we can call these thyroglossal duct anomalies um, to be as a more generic term. One of the problems with thyroglossal duct cysts is the risk of transformation into thyroglossal duct carcinoma. This occurs very rarely. Less than 1% of thyroglossal duct cysts will transform. The demographics of this disease mirrors that of thyroid cancer rather than that of thyroglossal duct cysts. That is, thyroid cancers and thyroglossal duct carcinomas tend to occur in adulthood, whereas thyroglossal duct cysts tend to present in childhood. That's not absolute, it's just a tendency. The findings that enable us to suggest thyroglossal duct carcinoma are calcifications within the lesion and mural nodularity as in this lobular enhancing mass in, in the wall of the thyroglossal, the thyroglossal duct cyst, which is predominantly cystic. So mural nodularity and calcifications. Unfortunately, infection will occasionally mimic this appearance, but it's still best to suggest that diagnosis. So let's talk about thyro thyromegaly. In the United States, the most common cause of thyromegaly is a multinodular goiter. These is an adenomatous benign disease, and the big problem with it is the mass effect it causes on surrounding structures, particularly the trachea. However, there are also thyroid cancers that will enlarge the gland, and thyroiditis, inflammatory diseases, um, usually autoimmune rather than infectious, that can affect the thyroid gland. So what are some of the factors that would suggest cancer within a thyroid mass? There are some types of calcification that would suggest cancer. Specifically, fine speckled calcifications are suggestive of papillary thyroid carcinoma. These calcifications are the same calcifications that we see in breast cancer. Histopathologically, they are comedocalcifications, same thing. They also appear in papillary thyroid carcinoma. Invasion. The thyroid capsule is a very good barrier, and adenomas simply enlarge the capsule. If there is invasion of surrounding structures, that suggests cancer. If there is regional lymphadenopathy, obviously this is uh, worrisome. Distant metastases, and also vocal cord paralysis. It turns out that extremely large adenomatous goiters can occur without causing vocal cord paralysis. It, if you see vocal cord paralysis, it is strongly suggestive of invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and even in the absence of other malignant signs should prompt a search for thyroid cancer. Having said that, massive enlargement of the gland is usually benign. Cancers tend to present before they become absolutely massive. Here's an example of a benign appearing goiter. It has none of the malignant features that we talked about. So what do we even say when we encounter a thyroid mass like this? Well, there are a few things that are really useful to the surgeon that we want to talk about. Namely, we want to talk about the effect on the trachea. Is the trachea displaced off midline? Mild, moderate, or severe? Is the trachea compressed 
from its normal uh, lateral dimension, mild, moderate, or severe, or you can give an actual number of its measurement. Another important factor is whether the mass extends below the sternum. If it does so, it may be more difficult to extract surgically and may require assistance from a cardiothoracic surgeon to get the whole thing out. So those, that plus the presence or absence of malignant features are going to be the uh, issues that are most important to the surgeons. Obviously you want to describe the extent of the lesion, particularly larger lesions, what their superior extent is, whether there's retropharyngeal extent, um, all the usual, usual things you discuss for a tumor as well.